I think we could profit this morning with a reminder of something that Ellen White wrote years ago. She was commenting on uh, a situation that is very common, and she said it like this. She, the commentary goes like this. Some are so heavenly minded, they are no earthly good. Do you understand what she's saying? Mm -hmm. I do because I've seen it for years among people, with people. Some are so heavenly minded they are no earthly good. And I could really expand and expound on that, but I'm, I'm, I don't care to point fingers at anyone. That's not the point. There's religion that is practical, but most religion is impractical. I read through an article recently that goes to another place on the planet, and it shows people coming together with their gifts for the gods, and they are bringing plates of food, fruit, vegetables, all kinds of things, plates of food, and putting them down at the place of worship, bowing, kneeling. And who do you suppose is there to eat the food? Monkeys. Well, that's on another occasion. Rats this long. In another article, some years ago, I saw them doing the same thing, different religion, different people, and the plates of food were there, and the place of worship was there, and cattle were wandering in off the street to eat the food on the plates, while people are kneeling around and saying prayers. Why, why would people do that? Because they believe something. Believe what? What do they believe? They believe that they are ministering to the spirits of their departed loved ones. And they're in the form of rats and cows. And cows and whatever. Okay? And yet many in that country, in that particular country, are hungry. There are a lot of people on the streets of the great cities in that country that are hungry and begging. Yeah. So I would look at that and I would say, that's impractical religion. That's so heavenly minded, it's no earthly good. That's, that's just my take on it. I'm not relegating them to being lost. That's not what we're talking about. When it comes to religious matters, people believe a lot of different things. But I would like to narrow the focus this morning and talk about Adventist Christians because that's who we claim to be. And sometimes it's very painful to look in the mirror. Sometimes it's very painful to look at ourselves. It's always easier to talk about the guy who's feeding rats or cows or whatever else. But maybe we ought to take a look inside. We began this discussion last week, and we're talking about a series. I should have crisis written here as well, but we're, we're, we're looking at a series of crisis events. And the idea is that with each crisis, there is a deepening, there is, there's more trouble. The crisis is deeper, larger, more devastating. So I want to make this practical for a few minutes and say uh, Judy and I are from the Gulf Coast. I was living in Mobile for several years and that was her home. And so we're not strangers on the Gulf Coast to hurricanes. 
sometimes you can see them brewing in the sky way off hundreds of miles away yet and there's a a sickening look to the color and you can tell this is a big storm this one's coming and you don't know yet if it's going to hit you or over there or over here or just who but um, having lived for several years on the Gulf Coast we know what a hurricane is <coughs> and of course we decided it was not safe to live where hurricanes are wont to blow so we moved to Tornado Alley <laughs> are you listening yeah. it was a smart move so which would you rather be hit by struck by a hurricane or a tornado? <laughs> now when I get on the West Coast, I love to talk to those folk out there and say, I wouldn't live in earthquake country for nothing. For anything. I don't think you're very smart living out here. So which would you rather enjoy? A hurricane, a tornado, or an earthquake? I can't let you know ahead of time. What if I, without too much exaggeration, what if I try to tell you and try to explain to you that what is pictured in Bible prophecy, in the Bible, and what is pictured absolutely in the writings of one Ellen White, is that there is a storm coming and it's a hurricane, tornado, and earthquake all together. And if you think that's an exaggeration, it is described in the book of Daniel as a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. It's described in the Gospels by Jesus saying it's a time of sorrows. And when this time comes, no one's going to stop it. So what we want to do is focus for a few minutes this morning on practical Christianity, practical religion. Along the Gulf Coast, if you know there is a hurricane coming and it's possibly going to be aimed at you, there are things that you do as quickly as you can and as best as you can. So tell me what you do if you think there's a hurricane on your way, coming your way. What, Bat, what, what do you do? Batten the hatches and evacuate. You get some plywood and you board up the, the windows, the doors. The water and you, get you pick up everything that's loose anywhere near your home. Right? right? Because the wind's going can turn those into weapons. Right. Okay? What else do you do? And you're not even sure the hurricane is going to hit you, but you think it's coming, and just in case it is coming your way, what else do you do? Get out of the dodge. What? Evacuate. Get out of the dodge. Get out of the dodge. Well, we haven't gotten there yet. We're coming to that. You go to the nearby Walmart, and you buy what? You buy everything that you can before your neighbor gets it. <laughs> that's the whole purpose that's the whole idea is to beat your neighbor to it <laughs> right yeah. now that is practical religion <laughs> and then you don't have room in the car to take it <laughs> don't have room to haul it away space to haul it away now Simeon said there's something else you do you get out of Dodge now that's me my wife wants to stay till the last five minutes. Not really, but you know. You get out of Dodge. Now, how did Jesus say that? Prophetically, how did Jesus say that? When ye therefore shall see, then do what? Flee. Get out of Dodge. Get out of town. Run for it. Uh, there's an, there is a brief passage from the pen of Ellen White, 
and she's talking about the crisis of the end times. And I borrowed a word out of this little passage right here. It says, hurry. And I'm going to quote her verbatim. Said the angel, tell the people to hurry, hurry, hurry. Well, uh, I've been taught that haste makes waste. So what is the wisdom of Scripture in a situation like this where, boy, if I run, I'm, I know there's something I'm going to leave behind that I shouldn't. I'm going to, uh, if I really run, if I really try to get out of here as quickly as possible, I, I'm going to leave something undone. Tell the people to hurry, hurry, hurry. There's another expression. It's on the little book, Getting Ready, that I gave you a copy of last Sabbath. The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events that are before them. See, this is practical Christianity. This is practical religion. But it is also light from... Yeah. I, I take it as light from heaven. And God, who sees the end from the beginning, knows that this one is a hurricane, a tornado, and an earthquake, and a flood, and a war, and, and, and. And so we, we, we don't want to live in a panic mode. Some people I know bought five-gallon buckets of corn and beans several years ago. I'm so thankful my wife and I didn't do that. Well, the corn and beans are no longer any good. Why not? Come on. Well, you shouldn't have done it. Are you listening? Let's talk about this. I put a green dollar mark all along the way here because doubtless in my reading of the word and of the words, each one of these crises is a deepening financial crisis. And uh, what happens when you run out of money? Come on. Well, you don't just jump in the car and head for wherever. Why not? Because you don't have money to buy what? Yes. Fuel. <clears throat> if people panic, and that's what's coming, that's what's coming in each of these crises events, when people panic, the first thing they do is run to the store to beat you to it. Batteries, water, Bread. Yep, yep, yep. So what do you do? Now I'm going to quote Ellen White right here. She says, there's a crisis coming. A storm is coming, relentless in its fury. And she talks about those who see what's coming, know what's coming because of light from heaven, know. And I was shown that those who had a little place to go and take their family and grow something to eat would live like what? Kings, Kings and queens. <clears throat> Out of the cities, this has ever been my plea, my cry, because trouble is coming in these cities, in these large cities. And soon it will be impossible to move. So I say we don't want to panic, but um, if we can anticipate and pray our way through what is coming, then I believe exactly what she wrote if we will earnestly inquire of God for duty, God will show us. 
God has places for His people if they will inquire. If they will inquire. Now, right here, right here, there's a crisis. I believe this crisis is imminent. I believe this crisis is days, weeks, whatever away. I hope, it's, I hope that's not correct. I hope it's not correct. But uh, the nations are bankrupt. If, if you want information along that line, I can give you hours on YouTube from experts, from statisticians, from people who are watching and measuring and keeping an account of what's going on. And uh, many nations around the world right now are bankrupt. And the process has been speeded up in the last three to four weeks because China has been devaluing its currency and dropping, dropping, dropping commerce worldwide. So you have little countries that make one thing, one thing, and they put it on the boat and they sell it. Have you been following the news for the last two, three, four weeks? Hundreds of these international transport vessels have been parked for weeks, not moving. Why not? Have you seen any of this? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of these international vessels, if carriers, whatever you want to call them. Cargo ships. Cargo ships, thank you. They're parked, especially all the way around the perimeter of the Atlantic and many also in the Pacific, but they're parked. Why not? Because the U.S. dollar has lost virtually all of its value. Well, why would it lose its value? Come on. It's funny oil. Money. What? It's oil. funny money? It's just ink on paper. That's why. That's all it is. And we have managed for 20, 30 plus years to get by with the Japanese selling us the automobiles. That's real stuff. Computers. That's real stuff. The Chinese, everybody's been selling to us, and what have we been paying them with? Come on. Green ink on white paper. All of that is over. All of that is over. I could come and bring you hours of it, current discussion, globally. Hours of showing you country after country after country, that has bankrupted in reality because of what is taking place. Now what the world wants to do, what you and I want the world to do, is turn this around. And the only way to do that is to reinvigorate the global economy. And in prophecy, this is going to be called the New World Order. It, it doesn't just come overnight. Government leaders of many nations have been talking about a new world order that's in the offing, in the offing, in the offing. Pope John Paul talked about the only hope for the world is a new world order. And it has to do with money. Now, when this crisis comes, wouldn't you like to be out of debt? Wouldn't you like to be out of debt? How can you do that? How can you get out of debt? You've been trying for years and it hasn't worked. Why should it work now? Come on. Come on. We're talking about practical Christianity. Jesus said, you have not because you what? So if you have debt and you want to be out of debt because I'm going to quote Ellen White right here as this time approaches avoid debt like leprosy. Do all in your power to be free of debt. Why? Why? What? It's a normal thing to live in debt. Why would you want to be free of debt? 
the practical side of religion is that we're going to face tornadoes, hurricanes, whatever. That's the practical side of life down here. But there's a practical side of spiritual reality, and that is we have a commission as Adventist Christians. We have a commission from heaven to sow present truth. How far? How wide? Come on. Every kindred tongue, nation, and people. And we have the dual, the dual task and responsibility of witnessing, working while we can, and every day it's going to become more expensive and more difficult to do. Do we have statements to that effect? The work that the church might have done in times of ease and what? <coughs> Prosperity. Forced to do under the most forbidding and difficult circumstances. So if I'm talking to a group of Adventist Christians like you or many others out there, I'm trying to talk to you about there's a storm coming. And if you have made no provision, no plan, you have no nothing prepared ahead of time for yourself and your family, that's not wise in view of what's coming. But we're not going to spend all of our days and all of our money and all, whatever trying to save our skin because we have a work to do. And so we have to balance living here and living there. That's what we have to do. That's not easily done at all. <coughs> Well, you and I have talked, most of us here, we've talked about some of these practical needs and ways in which we could make some preparation for what's ahead. Physical preparation. Uh, I have a recommendation, and you just take it for what it's worth, and it may not be worth anything to you, but I have a recommendation. Number one, write down your debt. All of them. All of it. Write it down. Get a total. And then start praying and asking God to take care of all of that debt. Now there are a lot of people I know, there are a lot of people who are very typical Americans and they have mortgages and they have and they have and they have and when you say pay off all of your debt, they look at you like, what planet are you from? Maybe you need to dispose of some things. Maybe several things. But pray about it. Pray about it and act on your prayers. This is the time. The call from a friend 30 minutes ago here is that they're on the news right now saying, get ready for war with Iran. So I want to share something with you. I'm in the book of Daniel. If you have a Bible handy right there, or if you don't, I'm going to read just a few verses in Daniel chapter 8. This is Daniel's second vision. In the first vision, he sees the four winds of heaven troubling the great sea, and the angel says in Revelation, but in the context of Daniel in Revelation, the angel says, the waters which you saw represent peoples, nations, and tongues. So the four winds of heaven are troubling. That would be a hurricane or a hurricane or a tsunami. I'm in Daniel 8 to begin with eight right here. One. I'm trying to get the setting in the first vision of chapter 7. This hurricane is blowing, troubling the waters of the whole world. Four winds of heaven. That's... And
And um, three great beasts are seen, a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Now, if you were to classify these three animals, you would say they are raptors. They are carnivorous. carnivorous. They kill their prey to be fed, right? The lion, the bear, the leopard. And the lion and the bear and the leopard are not friends with one another. They, they are in competition with one another. Now, of the three, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, which one would you reckon to be st strongest? Lion. No question about it. If you know anything at all, it's the lion. But this is no ordinary lion. He has uh, wings, and he does not have sparrow wings. He doesn't have bluebird wings. He doesn't have hummingbird wings. He has wings of, a, of an eagle. So just, just visually, this beast, this lion, is number one. And whatever attaching eagle's wings to number one means, he's got a double dose of number one. Because the eagle is number one. And something happens to this lion with eagle's wings. It has to happen to this lion. It has to come to this lion with eagle's wings. And the first thing that happens is his eagle's wings are what? stripped from him. And his lion's heart is what? Pulled out. And a man's heart is put in the place of his lion's heart. And he, instead of going on full, all fours the way lions should go, he's made to stand on his feet, it says, like a man. So number one, and number one has become a mere shadow of what he was. I'm not stretching too far here. And a consequence of his number oneness being broken and humbled, a consequence is the bear decides he can strut his stuff now. The bear does not rise, the bear does not threaten, the bear does not consume until the lion with eagle's wings is humbled. And in this same context, see, nature hates a vacuum. If you're number one, you fill up a whole lot of space. As a conse further consequence of the humbling of this lion, number one, number one, there is a leopard beast with four heads and four wings, which is a very strange picture indeed, and he is seen flying in the midst of heaven. So the lion has to represent something, someone, the bear has to represent something, someone, and the leopard has to represent something, someone. About verse 19 or so, Daniel asks the angel in the vision, what does this mean? And the angel says, these are three kings which shall arise out of the earth. Kingdoms, powers, nations, whatever you want to call it. These are three powers that are going to arise. And after that, it says, Daniel says, and after that, I saw a fourth beast, a terrible beast. Some translations read nondescript. He is so fearful and so different. He was different than the others that I had seen. And he is fierce, ferocious. He, is, he has teeth and nails of iron and brass. These are the weapons of a beast of prey. Teeth and nails. That's how you do the damage. 
He has teeth and nails of iron and brass. So we start out with this rather placid scene of a lion with eagle's wings, but he's humbled. And then the bear. And then the leopard. And then there's the terrible beast. The diverse beast. He was different than all the others. Now we have to get to Daniel 8. That's 7. That's the first picture. Now we're in chapter 8. Third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. There's a vision. And it comes to pass. And Daniel explains at the beginning of this vision where he is when the vision comes to him. Is that just filling up space? Is that information pertinent to what the picture is and what's going to be going on taking place in the vision? Absolutely. I was over at Shushan in the palace. Another word for Shushan is Susa. It's a very ancient, very old city, and it is still called Susa today. And it's located in the modern nation of Iran, which is also called <coughs> Persia. I was at Shushan in the palace in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river. Ulai, Ulai. The modern name of this river is the Karun River, K-A-R-U-N. And as you continue reading in the vision, this, this river flows from Susa or Shushan and meanders through two or three hundred kilometers. That's uh, 150 to 200 miles. This, this river meanders, picks up more tributary waters, and then is pouring itself into the just merged Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which are the principal rivers in the Middle East. And those flow through the modern nation of Iraq. So Daniel is watching all of this in his dream and his vision, and he is wondering, what does all of this mean? And Gabriel appears to him in this vision, in his dream, and says, uh, you saw a ram. Tell me what a ram is. It's a male goat. You saw a ram that had how many horns? Two horns. One horn was higher than the other. And the higher horn came up last. And these two horns, Gabriel goes on to explain, represent the kings of, or the powers of, or the governments of, or the nations of. Come on. They represent what? Media and Persia. Now you have to know a little bit of history and geography. If you do, you understand that modern Iraq is the heart of old media. And Persia is what country? Iran. It was then and it is now. Persia. And specifically in the last days. Now what happens is that this ram with two horns is um, he's a troublemaker. That's what you get when you read the vision. He's pushing. The idea in the original is he's a bully. He's pushing. <coughs> and he's pushing three directions. Do you remember the directions he's pushing? North, south, east, west. No east. South, that's one, yeah. North, south, and west. In a minute, that'll make wonderful sense or terrible sense or whatever. In a minute. Now, at the time of the end, Daniel is told, at the time of the end, this ram with two horns is going to push. And he is going to provoke, he's going to do something to provoke a power from the west. Now we see another beast coming up in the vision. This is a rough goat, a he goat, as opposed to a male sheep or ram. All right? This rough goat has how many horns? At least one. And it's called a horn of sight. He has a horn, a prominent horn. And the intent and purpose of that horn is to do damage. And whatever the ram with two horns 
decides to do to provoke his neighbors, and particularly the one from the west, way over yonder, beyond land and sea. Whatever he does, he does, and the goat comes across the face of the whole... And we're, we're just reading it. He comes across the face of the whole earth. He doesn't touch the ground as he comes, and he comes to the ram standing by the river. And we can pinpoint in the vision where that place by the river is. Anyhow, he comes to the ram, and he throws the ram to the ground, and he stamps on him, and he breaks both of his horns. And then he stands up and boasts. We're talking about the goat from the west. He stands up and boasts, and what does he say? It says, when he was strong, the notable horn, the horn of sight, the notable horn was what? Come on. When he stood up and boasted, the notable horn is broken. Now, we'd like to make some sense out of this, and we'd like to make some present truth sense out of this. When I first began to study this 35, 40 years ago, I identified Iraq, Iran, the United States. And I said so in a public setting. I wasn't right. The vision was right, correct. What we're looking at is a modern Iran, Persia, who has become a provoker in that part of the world, sponsoring terrorism, terrorism and terrorist acts all over the Middle East and beyond. And of the ram with two horns, which horn is the real provoker? Come on. Is it Persia or is it Persia. media? It's Persia. Persia is the one. And this was the comment that was made this morning on the news is that we're giving them back a hundred billion dollars and get ready for war. Because that's what Iran is up to. Now, we'd like to know, you and I, who has allied itself or themselves with Iran. That's important. Russia and China. Who has allied themselves with Iran? Come on. Russia and China. Russia, China. the bear, and China, China. The, leopard. the leopard. Now, Iran has threatened over and over again that if the United States attacks them, Iran, pardon me, Persia, Iran, and Iraq, if the United States attacks, then they will bring about a situation that will bankrupt the United States of America. That is a public boast. Are you listening? That they have the ability of bankrupting the United States. Well... John, we did that. Iran. Is Iran that strong? Is Iran that wealthy? Is Iran that powerful that they can bankrupt the United States? No, but their allies can. But let's listen to Russia and China in recent weeks and months <laughs> as, they, as they have warned the United States not to attack Iran. And if you do, What's the threat? If you do, not, I'm going to push a button and all my nuclear weapons are going to fall on your head. No, no, no. What are, what are they threatening to do? Dump all the dollars. China alone has, owns how many U.S. dollars? 1.3 trillion. And the Russians have U.S. dollars. And if they suddenly dump those on the world financial markets, are you listening? Let's make some sense out of all of this. So Simeon and I were watching the financial, uh, one of the financial networks, and I said, Simeon, all these people, the markets are going this way, and all these people are selling their stocks. Who's buying them? Who's buying all of these stocks? Because we're talking about billions and on the way to trillions of dollars. Who is buying these? 
Federal Reserve. Well, you're not supposed to know that. What? You're not supposed to know that the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury are buying this, this debt that is being dumped in our markets. And how are they buying it? Printing money. Funny money. Now, the rest of the world has made it known in recent weeks and months that they will no longer accept U.S. dollars for their commerce. No longer. If Russia and China decide to dump one point whatever trillion U.S. dollars on the world markets, who is supposed to pay that bill? Who is supposed to absorb all of that money with real money? Yeah, the United States. There's the bankruptcy. Some years ago I was in Kansas City and I was speaking to a group there and I made the statement that the day is coming when the United States is going to bankrupt. And there was a gentleman there and he just scoffed and laughed out loud, I mean out loud, and he said that's ridiculous, the United States will never go bankrupt. <coughs> well, how the mighty are fallen, the Bible says. We're on the way to something. Now, please listen. I don't know when this crisis is going to arise. We're talking about war with the goat, the ram, and the he-goat. I don't, I don't know the date of that. I suspect, and last week I even put a date on it, but a wiser person said, no, don't, don't put a date on it. Even though you may be correct, don't put a date on it. Leave yourself a little breathing room, a little wiggle room. And so I decided that was good counsel. So what I'm going to say is that I believe, and I still do, that there's a very strong possibility that before this year is over. And what year is this? 16. It has just turned 16. I still believe that prophetically the stage is set for a war before this year is over. And in connection with that war or shortly thereafter, maybe in 17, maybe whatever, I don't know. But the lion is going to have its wings plucked. My concern at this point is not that a hurricane is coming or a tornado is coming, or an earthquake is coming, or a flood is coming, though that's what we're talking about. We're, ta we're talking about winds of strife, and Jesus says all of these are the beginnings of sorrows that are going to come, and it's going to remain a time of sorrows until Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. That's Ellen White. I am concerned for you and your family and me and my family in practical terms. Not going to go through all the list of things that you ought to be doing, that you should be making the purchase if you have any extra money, funds at all, things that you ought to be purchasing and putting away quietly. Don't be walking out waving it in front of the world, but things that you ought to be doing. The thing that concerns me is that we have a work to do Money is becoming scarce. It looks like it's going to become very scarce. But if you and I ask God for what we need, does God have ways? Come on. So when the children of Israel were to make a long jaunt from Egypt to the Promised Land, uh, did God provide certain wealth to them? Yes, he did. Well, there were no Walmarts in the desert. Where were they going to spend it? Come on. They built a temple. They had the first need of that wealth was to build the sanctuary. You can read about that in the book of Exodus. The people brought 
cloth and material. They brought gold and silver and precious stones. They brought, they brought, they brought. Where did they get it? God said, the Egyptians will give it to you. And they did. Get, we want to get you out of here. Go away and leave us alone. And here. So we have a pattern of God providing, making provision for the need that was ahead. You listening? We see that again with the birth of Jesus and Joseph and Mary. How wealthy were Joseph and Mary? They were so wealthy they stayed in the barn. Right? In the cow stall. Now the time came that Herod was threatening the life of the child. And the Lord sent an angel in a dream or vision to Joseph and said, "Up, get up and take the, mother, the woman and the child and flee into Egypt. Now it costs money to stay at the Holiday Inn instead of the cow stall. It costs money for food. It costs money. It, 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 they needed money. Did God make provision? And the answer is? Yes. Tell me what the provision was. Well, it was chocolate pie. No, it wasn't. What was it? We're talking about practical religion. What did they need? Money. money. They needed real money. What did the wise men bring? Money. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. And the frankincense and myrrh were worth more than the gold. Most folk don't know that. They brought money. And that money had to last them for at least a year or two years or whatever they stayed down in Egypt and get them all the way back home to Nazareth. Did God anticipate their need? Yes. Did they know they had the need? No. But God made provision. Now I can give you dozens of statements from her pen saying that God knows and God has plans if we will earnestly inquire of Him, He will show us what to do. So, not only is there provision made by heaven to help you and me and our families here, we're looking for what? If we have bills to pay and we want to get out of debt, what are we looking for? Chocolate pie. What are we looking for? real money are you listening the currency that is presently available in the United States is not real money the new world order that is about to be become reality on the planet is going to require that any nation and every nation that is going to do business internationally will be required to back it up with what? Yes, Real money. Can you just look ahead and think ahead and understand that we don't need funny money, we don't need fiat money, we need real money. And it just so happens that that is the decision that is, has been made and is about to be worked out. And that real money needs to not only take care of you and your family for what's ahead, but provide the means for us to do what? Print millions and millions and millions of publications. I honestly believe that before this year is over, we're going to have a meltdown in several large American cities. Uh, the social fabric of American society is, is broken. It's torn. And you're not going to take a little needle and thread and patch it up. It's just, it's, it's not there anymore. It's not there. Uh, there are too many angry people 
in this country. What is the evidence that there are a lot of angry people in this country? Come on. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Test case number one, Donald Trump. Why are so many people attracted to Donald Trump? Because they are mad as butch. You're listening. So there's this side of society in this country that is angry, and it is apparent, it is evident, it, it, you cannot escape it. And then there's another side of society in this country, among the poor, the out of work, the whatever, and they are angry. Why are they angry? They feel that they're being, they're being cheated, mistreated, that the bankers are getting paid millions of dollars a year bonuses and they can't even pay their light bill and they are angry. Now what is the evidence of that anger? Don't talk about the trouble in the cities yet. We'll get there in a moment. What is the evidence of that anger? What's the guy's name running against Hillary Clinton? Sanders. Is it Bernie Sanders? And what is his message? What is his appeal? I don't know. That the one percent have all the money and we have none and we're going to change that. That's his message. And is he winning converts? Oh, yes. Yeah. So we have conditions in this country. You want to call it a hurricane? You want to call it a tornado? You want to call it an earthquake? You want to call it a flood? It's all of that and more. All of that and more. And it's coming, it's coming, it's already here, but they are working overtime to keep it out of the evening news. I read one article, and we're talking about verifiable. I read one article that said most Americans have no idea of the plans that have been laid in Washington that if trouble comes whatever it may be if trouble comes in this part of the country Uncle Sam can come and tell you how many people you're going to take into your home and they have maps already drawn already shown that if this crisis occurs here then the people over here are going to be required to and so uh, I'll tell you what that sounds like to me. Get out of and into places where the houses are not crowded closely together, where you'll be free of enemies and, and, and. Get out. And so you and I, through God's leading, God's blessing, and our own choosing, have located ourselves in a rural setting. Now you and I are here. We're not wealthy, but we are wealthy. <coughs> and wealthy in what regard? Come on. Let's, let's not just talk about spiritual, spirituality. We are wealthy in that if there is a real need, we can take the real need to a real God and ask for a real blessing and... Expect a real blessing. Expect one. Yes. Well, folk, I just, uh, for most of my life, when I was eight years old, the Korean War was breaking out. I was eight years old. And every day I would come home from school, second grade, Every day I would come home from school and wait for the local newspaper guy to come by. He was on a bicycle and he was tossing the newspaper out for those who subscribed. And I waited for him to come by every afternoon and I had to read the headlines about the Korean War and all that was going on over there. So the news and I go way back way back. 
and I try every day to get some up-to-date news. I try. And I do that because I believe that Daniel and Revelation are all about the news of the day, of the end. And I said to someone recently, I said, you know, I've been traveling for a long time, for years, for 35 plus years I've been traveling, I've spoken to a lot of people, and I believe more strongly today that this is the time and this is the end time than I have ever believed in all these years. And that's the truth. I cannot watch or listen to the news or read the news or follow what's going on without saying, that's what it says in the book. That's what it says in the red books. That's what it says. This is where we are. Father in heaven, we need to be practical Christians. We need to be spiritual Christians. How can we balance these needs? How can we move heaven to help us, to take care of us, to enable us, to enlighten us, to empower us? What can we ask? What can we give? What can we pay for the blessing that we need? And finally, we decide that the payment has already been made. We just need to act in faith and ask. And if we can see and if we can understand and if we can believe that the end is upon us, then we know how we should be praying. We know what we should be asking for. Not just to get out of debt but the means to print millions and millions and millions of publications. Years ago, you gave Ellen White a dream, a vision, years ago. She was 17 or 18. Her husband James was just 21 or 22. And he came home from the field working. He came home and she said, James, I have a message for you. The Lord showed me that you should begin to print a little paper and send it out. It will be small at first, but from the light given me, it will grow until it circles the whole earth. And so I'm praying that we will be the fulfillment, or at least have part in the fulfilling of that vision. We've got to reach the whole world, Jesus said before the end will come. You have used this little ministry to accomplish great and wonderful things. We marvel. We praise your name. We thank you. But there is a world, and it's on the way to an appointment, a prophetic appointment with the end. A great struggle and storm is just ahead. Thank you for blessing us in the past but we pray greater blessings come down. Send them now. Send them quickly. We thank you for hearing and blessing and answering in Jesus' name. Amen.